Hey, I'm Jana, the little sister. And I'm Jeff, her big brother. Welcome to Sibling Rivalry, a podcast about our favorite sport, baseball. This week on Sibling Rivalry Baseball, it's all about the majors and the minors. Talking about the military and digging for gold. But first, I'm grabbing my shovel to uncover some SRBB headlines. The iconic Dodger dog is still sold at Dodger Stadium, but it's not brought to you by Farmer John. After the 2019 season, Farmer John made the decision not to renew their contract with the Dodgers. Farmer John has produced Dodger dogs since 1972. A new Dodger dog supplier will be announced soon. Roger Goodell must have been devastated he didn't get to hug the number one pick of the 2021 NFL Draft. The Jacksonville Jaguars picked Clemson quarterback Trevor Lawrence and his fabulous Fabio Hairdo with their number one pick. He was at home with family in South Carolina. But the number two pick, Zach Wilson, quarterback from BYU, went to the J-E-T-S, Jets, 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 and got the coveted first hug of the draft from the commissioner. Trey Lance, quarterback from North Dakota State. Kyle Pitts, a tight end from Florida. And Jamar Chase, wide receiver from Louisiana State, rounded out the top five. And this is the first time since 1999 that the top three picks were all quarterbacks. Michael Collins, the command module pilot for the Apollo Apollo 11 mission to the moon has died after battling cancer. He was 90 years old. In his career, he logged 266 hours in space. May 1st marked the 147th running of the Kentucky Derby. Two long shots finished one and two. Medina Spirit at 12 to one odds outpaced the field to win, followed by Mandelown at 26 to one odds. Hot Rod Charlie at 5 to 1 rode to third place while the race day favorite Essential Quality took the fourth spot. Three time Indianapolis 500 champion Bobby Unser has died. He won the Indianapolis 500 in 1968, 1975, and 1981. He's part of the only pair of brothers to win the greatest spectacle in racing. He died of natural causes at his home in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He was 87. You can find these and past week's headlines on our website, SiblingRivalryBB.com. Remember to rate and subscribe wherever you listen. And tell a friend to listen to the Sibling Rivalry Baseball Podcast. In honor of AAA opening day, actually minor league opening week, or is it still the minor leagues? Or is it the professional development league as Major League Baseball, who now controls all of baseball, is calling it? The weird thing about baseball, the minor leagues now, is that there are only 120 teams. So every major league team has a team in actually a total 150 if you throw in the uh, Gulf Coast League and the Arizona League. And then there's a bunch of others. We talked about the Atlantic League being one of the main experimental leagues. This week, we also saw a change from the Pioneer League, that they're going to do something different with their rules and how they handle games. And I didn't realize this. I thought it was just the Atlantic League that had the agreement with major leagues. But then we find out the Pioneer League has an agreement, as does the American Association and the Frontier League. One of the things with the new professional development league but it'll always be the minors is the entire professional development league and the affiliates at triple a double a high a and low a will all have salary increases for their players so that is really nice it's not a huge it's probably well i guess it's 38 percent to 72 percent that's what it went from so that's something positive moving forward, even though I am concerned with the minors being manfreded. I think it's already on its way there. At first, I thought the whole reworking of the minor league system is not what it seemed to be. And there were cities that lost teams, but for the most part, it made it seem like baseball was only going down to just this 120 or 150 with the Arizona League and Gulf Coast League. And that was it. And then, of course, you had these independent leagues, but everybody else would be independent leagues. But they signed deals with the independent leagues so that they can use them. And while that's probably good for the independent leagues, as far as their agreement probably gets them some money or something to play games with uh, MLB, MLB 
probably isn't paying them enough to make sure that those players are making a better wage. So I don't know how that part, but it made it seem like all these other teams are going to be cut loose and just hanging out there unless they could get into an independent league. And what I think we'll see is two or three more independent leagues pop up and all those other teams will get in there and Major League Baseball will just have agreements with all of them so they can try all their silly man rules. Now, we love minor league baseball. You have a AAA team near you. Lately, I have a AAA team near me. Actually, I think we'd rather have the AAA team play <laughs> than the, the Dodgers have seemed like a AAA team, but we'll get to that later. There's low A now. They used to be high A clubs in the California League. And you always get to see players. I've seen quite a few players through the years that have made it to the big club with various degree. I think that probably the best minor league player I ever saw as far as where they started out and where they finished was a kid named Ken Griffey Jr. Got to see him play in A ball in San Bernardino. The uh, team that's close to me, the Albuquerque Isotopes, once it used to be the Springfield Isotopes, but the, or the uh, Dukes. Well, they, they were the Dukes, and there are people that will continue to call them the Dukes. They will not refer to them as the Isotope to this day. But Homer and Marge are have a special place at the lab because of that episode from when the Springfield Isotopes and they couldn't keep them. So guess where they moved? They moved to Albuquerque. And I think that happened like way before <laughs> the Simpsons always kind of have like a, few, a crystal ball or something going right. on. They're always ahead in of their things. writing room. <laughs> but the uh, Albuquerque Isotopes, they used to be the Dodgers triple A team. So that for was years. a lot of fun for me. Yeah. Tommy Lasorda was a manager for the Dukes like in 72. I think yeah. it was. And that was a lot of fun for me because I was able to see Jocelyn play. I remember him the most because he was really just belting the homers in in AAA. But Off now right. they're now they're the Rockies AAA team. So not quite as exciting, but also really does shine a light on what's going on with the Rockies, which we will also get to later. What really got us thinking about the minors, not only because, hey, we have minor league baseball this year and that this week is opening week, but we also saw that the Pioneer League has changed a rule in how they handle games. And the Pioneer League, if you're not familiar with it, as I wasn't, established in 1939, Billings, Montana, Boise, Idaho, Great Falls, Montana, Missoula. So a lot of Montana, the Ogden Raptors, the Rocky Mountain vibes, and they've decided that there's no need to put a ghost runner on second. When you go into extra innings, they've gone to, and I believe it was Justin Turner who brought this up last year, they've decided to take that idea of the home run derby. This is from the press release. To avoid the excessive strain on our pitching staffs, Dodgers, are you listening? The Pioneer Baseball League will not have extra innings, but will rather employ a first-of-its-kind knockout rule that resolves tied games with a head-to-head sudden-death home run duel. Under the rule, each team designates a hitter who receives five pitches with the game determined by the most home runs hit. If still tied after the first knockout round, another hitter is selected for a sudden death home run faceoff until a winner is declared. I like it. Well, if you're going to do stuff like that, what what difference is that to having a ghost runner? Really, this is probably better as far as if you're worried about time, because that's what they're worried about. This is short attention span theater is what they're going for. And how long before we have major league games are just going to be the length of a little league game so we can cut down time? Five innings. That's all you play. A micro game. Yeah. yeah. Or they'll go to the seven innings like the double headers now. Why not have the the home run derby at the end of the game? Like penalty kicks in soccer. Or you know what? If you want to put a time limit on the game, this is the thing about baseball that was great compared to every other game. There's no clock. Why don't we just go to that then? If that's what the whole idea is, we just want shorter games. Then just put a time limit on it. There's a two hour time limit on a game, and once you get to two hours, it's done. They say get rid of all the lights 
at all the stadiums. So you can only play day games. And then when it gets dark, specifically put it so it gets darker. I know it's during the summer. So your games would start later. But as soon as it gets dark, then you can't play. And then so you might only get, you know, three innings or or so, depending on when you start the right. game. But, you know, the three batter minimum that was introduced, that was supposed to shorten the game. It has shortened the game 34 seconds. Most games this season, this 2021 season, are three hours. Three hours and 16 minutes, I think, or seven minutes was the somewhere around there. So having all of these different things with the three batter minimum, the clock out there for pitchers it hasn't really done anything and what will be interesting with this home run derby is this is going to be you know if it's still tied so if they both hit what five home runs and it's tied how long will that go until how long is the game to begin with I don't know I think it's silly I think Manfred really needs to just leave the game alone. And although I do think this rule, especially for minors, for the minor leagues, you get people in the stands, it is exciting for the home run derby, but just leave it alone. Why do we need somebody to come in and try to tinker with the time? We don't. Getting here to a point that eventually they're just going to go. There's a two-hour time limit on every game. So if you play three innings in two hours or you play nine innings or 15 innings, at the end of two hours, it's a tie or there's some maybe there's some kind of a sudden death thing like a home run derby or something. But we're going to get to that point. People don't want to sit for more than two hours, and every game is more than two hours. But instead of addressing – how many things slow the game down that are actually not your your gimmicks are not going to change. So the Pioneer so the, League has a couple of other things too. So they've announced that they will also have a designated pinch hitter and a designated pinch runner rule. So once a game, a team can replace a player with a pinch hitter or pinch runner without removing that player from the lineup. The pinch hitter and pinch runner would be ineligible the rest of the game, however. So an example would be the Dodgers could pinch hit Edwin Rios for catcher Austin Barnes and still keep Austin Barnes um, behind the plate. Or they could pinch run Rios for Barnes and keep Barnes in the game, but Rios would be ineligible to play the rest of the game, but Barnes would remain as the catcher. So teams get one designated pinch hitter and one designated pinch runner per game. Okay. I'm not sure what the (laughs) point of that is. I I don't either. I I get it though. You get down towards the end, your, your player's not hitting well. So you pinch hit for them without them leaving the game. The pinch runner thing, you need a run. You want somebody fast. You've got Albert Pujols on first base. Or what's his name? Vogelbach. You know, yeah. these are guys that don't run very fast. And they're at they're on base. You put the pinch runner in because you're trying to, to score a run or trying to get something going. I see the the designated pinch runner for the reasons that you just mentioned. The pinch hitter, I don't get it. The designated pinch hitter. And especially in this scenario I gave you, I would probably would rather see Austin Barnes hit than have Edwin Rios at this point (laughs) pinch hit. (laughs) But yeah, again, it's situational and, uh, but you do want the faster guys on the base. So that makes sense to me, but. But why not do that for a whole game then? Yeah. I would think that that would be, you know, here's our slowest guy. We're going to have a pinch runner. So he's got to get to first base. But after that, the pinch runner comes out and finishes up. A couple other things. Uh, One thing that, it makes sense. Uh, check swing. Normally only the catcher or the umpire can point down and say, I think maybe even the pitcher, but they can appeal to whatever bag first or third, depending on what side the batter hits from to whether they went around or not. Now the batter can appeal. If the umpire, if the home plate umpire calls it, they can appeal 
to that uh, first or third base umpire as to whether or not did I go around and then they so they can appeal that. So that one's not such a big deal. And then the other thing that they're doing in all PBL games is three man umpiring crews instead of two. That way they have a better view of everything that's going on. They just want to make sure that all of the different situations in a game are better covered. So they're going to add one more umpire, which if they're anything like Angel Hernandez, you might as well just stay with the two. (laughs) Yeah, I was thinking that we've seen a lot in this season, just in this, you know, we got through, we're through April with really interesting calls at the plate, some interesting calls out in the field. So yeah, I'm wondering how this will, this will work or if they're better umpires. They might be better umpires. They're younger. They're more excited about doing it. It feels like with the umpires, especially like Angel Hernandez and and a couple of the other ones that always seem to be the names that pop up, that takes an act of Congress to get fired from that place. And we know (laughs) Congress doesn't act on anything hardly. So, Well, and Angel Hernandez had his, he had a lawsuit against MLB for discrimination. It was thrown out, but now he's appealing, but he's still out there calling games and out on the field. So, yeah, I think you're right. I will say going back to the minors as far as the organizational or how things kind of came out, the one thing the New York Pen League, which was started in 1939, was eliminated, which was sad because when we lived in New Jersey, Planet Head and I, we used to go see the Trenton Thunder play and the Trenton Thunder are no more. That was a sad day to hear. They have a really nice stadium. It's right there on the Delaware River. Um, it will be utilized this summer, but not quite the same. And one of the things about the minor leagues, too, is I know they, they're doing these different things. Like in the Atlantic League, the Pioneer League, obviously, too, we just talked about these rule changes. But if you have an opportunity to go to a minor league game, whatever the level, go. It's a lot of fun. They have really good ticket prices. We used to go see the Bowie Bay Sox when we lived in D.C., and they had Tuesday nights were belly buster baseball nights. So you got a ticket to the game. You got a drink, a hot dog, popcorn, and peanuts all wow. for like the 14 one bucks. One low price. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> yeah. And and. Minor league stadiums, there's rarely a bad seat in the house. Right. I remember we used to be able to get seats behind home plate down in like Lake Elsinore or at San Bernardino for like five, six bucks. And you'd have a great seat that you'll never get for that kind of price at a major league park. Yeah, it's just a, it's a lot of fun and they, they have great promotions. One of the promotions I saw, I'm sure it'll be on eBay, but is my favorite. I love Seinfeld. So the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp will actually have, it's like, I guess it's kind of like a, bo- a bobblehead of George, it's a bobblehead, Cost- yeah. of George Costanza with a big plate of shrimp because he was, he had worked for the Yankees in, in Seinfeld and yeah, the ocean is calling. They want their shrimp back. That's right. They're <laughs> running out of shrimp. <laughs> That's right. So I, I, um, that would be awesome. Also, I think it's the Charleston River Dogs are going to be giving for their number two promotion. The first, I think, thousand fans or something like that will get a roll of toilet paper. Of course, our favorite thing probably about the minors is not all of the rules and the crazy promotions are fun, but it's the names of the teams. And we've talked about this before. And on our webpage, there is a name generator so that you can come up with your own minor league team name. So go check that out. But sometimes some of these teams are, you know, they're the same. The Dodgers triple A team is the Dodgers. Yeah, boring. It's not, you know, the Oklahoma city Dodgers, they were the Redbirds. before that they were the 89ers. Which made more sense. Yes. And a lot of times they, they do like uh, Louisville Bats, triple A team. 
That makes sense. They make baseball bats there. How about the but Cedar then there's like Rapids? The Iowa Cubs or yeah, the Cubs. I think every minor league team for the Cubs is the Cubs. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and but what about the Cedar Rapids Colonels? So what's Iowa known for? Corn, and right. it's not Colonels. You know, like C O L O N E L. It's popcorn. Colonels. <laughs> K E R N E L S. Yeah. K E R N E L S. <laughs> One eight seven seven. <laughs> corn. <laughs> and then the Asterix have a, a new AAA team in the Sugarland Skeeters. That's one thing with the the changes around the league. They try to get AAA teams closer to their main club. So that was one of the key parts of this realignment for the minors, especially for the AAA affiliates, was to be closer to their major league clubs, which, as you mentioned, 200 over they'll be over 200 miles closer to their parent clubs, which they hope will allow fans in the region more access to watching their major league baseball team's prospects and that they'll continue with the club and, and it'll go over into the uh, majors. Now, one of the things that is interesting is that each league, so in the AAA, for example, the Isotopes will start a six-game series with the Sugarland Skeeters tonight and in Albuquerque, but each league will be off every Monday except for AAA West, which will be off each Wednesday. And the reason is because purchasing plane tickets was cheaper for those teams for Wednesday travel than for Sunday night or Monday. So it all came down to plane tickets in the end for those guys. But like everything, it also, it's all about the money. Exactly. But it also kind of keeps them somewhat kind of in a bubble, even though the triple A East teams will average 6,808 miles down from 11,579 uh, miles for the international league in 2019. And the triple A teams will average 14,609 miles down from 20,081 miles when they were the Pacific coast league. Well, the Pacific Coast League at one time, everybody was more toward the Pacific Coast. But then it got where Fresno, which is now an A team, not a triple A team, but Fresno would be playing New Orleans. Yeah. How is New Orleans a Pacific Coast League team? It's because there was no other leagues. They were It was kind of falling apart for some, whatever reason. They couldn't keep the leagues together. All I right, will well, say my favorite. I just got my favorite new shirt in. The mail, and that is the baseball team in North Carolina minor league, the Carolina Disco Turkeys. <laughs> and it's a cool shirt. You got to take a picture and put it up to all of the uh, the social media and on the web page. And then the other minor league teams that I just saw four million dollars just in merchandise. The Rocket City Trash Pandas. Which is, they've got some good colors. And then the Trash Panda, which is a raccoon, is uh, is pretty cool. It's a great logo. And that's what we're talking about. There's a fun in the minors that the majors doesn't, doesn't have. I guess once you get to the majors, you're in the big leagues of whatever career field you're in. You can have fun in the lower levels. If you have a job that requires a degree, you went to college for four, six, eight, 12 years, whatever it took, and you get out of college and you go to that career, they expect you to be serious in your career. You should have fun in college because now we're serious. No more fun in games. Uh, another team that I found that I like the name of that uh, I haven't seen their stuff, but uh, in the Frontier League. The Midwestern Division, Florence, Kentucky has a team and they're called the Yalls. It's time for Dodger baseball. I've been feeling kind of off lately. Like, just not all there. 
I'm beginning to feel like I'm a member of the Dodgers. Are you injured? Um, probably. Are you not having fun? No, definitely not having fun. Mentally, mentally out of it. Frustrated? No, I'm still getting paid. I just not, you know. Well, the Dodgers played the Reds and the Brewers. And they lost both of those series. They did have two big wins, one in the Cincinnati series, one in the Milwaukee series, but that's about it. They haven't won a series since they split with Seattle. (laughs) And while that seems like a long time ago, they've only played the Padres, the Reds, and the Brewers since then, but they've lost all three of those series with only one win in each. Yeah, it's... Does it matter if it's a big win, if they can't follow up and build upon that? Well, the game, the last game with Cincinnati was Kershaw Day. Kershaw went seven innings. He had four hits, no runs, one walk, eight strikeouts. And then the offense came alive in the eight. They exploded for six runs. They ended up winning that game eight to nothing. So we're like, all right, this is a good win. They're going to go to Milwaukee and they're going to continue it. No, they did not. They did not continue it. And in Milwaukee, it got worse and injuries. And one that is really hard to swallow is Dustin May, who was pitching in the third game against the Brewers. And I think it was only this second inning. So he hadn't been out there that long. Felt a shooting pain in his elbow, which no pitcher ever wants to feel. And he was taken out in the second inning got an MRI and he will be having Tommy John surgery on May 11th. So he'll be out the rest of this year and probably a chunk of next year. So yeah. really 2023 is when we can expect to, to see a fully functional. Yeah. And what we've been seeing is sure you miss one whole season, but chances are it's two seasons worth until you're right again. Exactly. And Dustin, had a one and one record, 2.74 ERA, 35 strikeouts, 0.957 whip, and a 0.4 war this season. He was doing really well. Yeah, the Dodgers have the worst record in baseball since that second Padres series. They've won just one, what's that, three games out of three series. Yeah. That they've won. And like in the past, it seemed like they didn't lose any series. Right. I, It's been rumored that someone thinks there's a curse. That they've got like the curse of the Bambino, whatever, the curse of Chavez Ravine or something, or the Billy Goat or the Black Sox from Chicago. Any of those and others, some kind of curse. It seems like it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I mean, what else can you blame it on other than they just are not hitting? And we've seen, like I mentioned, the third game in the Cincinnati series, they beat Cincinnati eight to nothing. That was one of the first games in a long time that they actually look like the Dodgers of old. And then they go into Milwaukee. Means, uh, Two weeks earlier. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? The Dodgers of two weeks earlier. And then they go into Milwaukee, and you're thinking, like I said, okay, they are they got the win at home. Kershaw had a good day. And, you know, he went seven innings, had four hits, eight strikeouts. And they get on the plane to Milwaukee, and somewhere – over the middle of the country. Maybe that's the the curse or the fairy god, the evil stepmother, evil 
wicked witch, whatever, put her curse on the plane and said, okay, here you go. I don't know. I think it has to do with Farmer John and the it hot It could. Dogs. You know, I, that is something. It sounds silly, but Farmer John has been around since night i mean the dodger dog has been around i think since 1962 but J- farmer john's been producing it since 1972 and all this time i thought well there it's always going to be farmer john and then you find out this year that in 2019 how the dodgers and farmer john could not come to an agreement does not make sense to me but i'm thinking that if that is the issue then Stan Caston, they need to be calling Farmer John up right now and say, we will, whatever you want, we will give you. We need Farmer John hot dogs back. So that very yeah. well could be. I think it, I think you are kind of on the right track there. Other than the fact that the Dodgers just can't hit. You have Corey Seager who has seemed to forgotten how to play shortstop is swinging at pitches that he normally wouldn't swing at. I think he's looking at now with the batting, he's going to have to improve, but defensively he looked to see how much Tatis got. And he said, I don't have to play that great a defense. Look how much money I can get. But unfortunately that's bleeding over into his offense. Yeah. So, I mean, if he is going to get an error every game, but then hit two home runs a game, okay, then we will forgive him for right. his his defense. But, yeah, it's bleeding over. The series with Cincinnati, game one, it went into Zinnings. It was tied 3-3. Who does Dave Roberts put in? Kenley Jansen. You never put Kenley in in a game that's tied or 2-0 it needs to be like 20 to nothing 20 to 5 <laughs> well i think we texted about the 8 to nothing game was that it was only 2 to nothing and they had kinley up and i think i told you i said they they probably saw kinley was coming up and they said we need a bigger lead they were like jaws we need a bigger boat Yes. Kinley's coming in to pitch. Yeah, and he ended up in that first game giving up a home run to Jesse Winkler, who Jesse Winkler was having quite a game that in that game, uh, game one. And that was the end because then, you know, you have your ghost runner on second, so it's automatic to run homer, and Dodgers could not capitalize. It couldn't. They leave guys on base all the time. Runners in scoring position, very frustrating. Uh, game two, another loss. They lost six to five. Walker Bueller was pitching again. He six, uh, six, about six innings, um, gave up seven hits, five runs. He did have 10 strikeouts, but if you have no offense, it doesn't help. Game three. Ask Jacob DeGrom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You need to have a support group with the Dodgers starting pitching and Jacob DeGrom part of that. Then they go into Milwaukee game one, Eric Lauer, who was called up from the alternate site to face the Dodgers. He has a six and zero record against the Dodgers. He's now the Dodger whisperer and he has a He's one. He's not even the whisperer. He's the Dodger killer. He's a Dodger <laughs> slayer. <laughs> he pretty much is. He has a 1.89 ERA against the Dodgers. He is 6 and 0 against the Dodgers, but he is 9 and 19 with a 5.42 ERA against any other team named that is named uh not the Dodgers. So <laughs> <laughs> uh so Craig Council was working his magic there and it's like who can I get to pitch? And it was Lauer versus Bauer, Trevor Bauer to go 8 innings. And he, he pitched a complete game. He did. He in looked loss, really good. Then he he lasted longer than Lauer did. Yeah. Problem is, and, he gave up more than Lauer did. He was not the Brewer Slayer. No, he gave up a home run to Tommy Shaw for a two run home run, and that was the 
That was it. And then in game three, another loss, three to one. And you look at these and you think, well, it's only two to one or three to one. But it's just the offense can't get moving. So in game two, Jackie Bradley Jr. of the of the Brewers hit his 100th career home run in that game. Edwin Yusita got the start, his major league debut. He did get the loss. Uh, the offense, again, could not get hits. The bullpen had shutout innings from Scott Alexander, Mitch White, Victor Gonzalez, and Jimmy Nelson. Uh, Milwaukee did get a run against Blake Trinan, but the five pitchers combined to give up one run over six innings. So you had the bullpen in there trying to do something. The one run for the Dodgers came from A.J. Pollock, who hit his second home run of the season. And with A.J. Pollock, I wonder, he doesn't play every day, but to me, he seems like he should be an everyday player. Right. Versus putting somebody like Luke Rayleigh in left field. Why isn't A.J. playing? And is that because of who's pitching? Or whatever Dave is thinking. It definitely has a feel to Dodgers of old, meaning a couple seasons ago, where everything is a matchup and we gotta we gotta work that instead of doing like last year. And I know that there's a lot of injuries with this team, but everything is now back to that. It's all about matchups. And instead of riding the hot hand, if somebody's in a groove, stay with them. Yeah. If I know that they want to get these people, you know, like Luke Rayleigh and that who've shown some promise. They want to get them the reps. But if they're not coming through, guess what's starting? Minor league season. Send them down to AAA, not to the alternate site. Send them to to Oklahoma City and let them get some real game experience against other people who are fighting to get to the bigs. They all want to come to the show. Yeah. So that's a question I have with A.J. Pollock. Uh, game three was a tough loss. They lost six to five in Zinnings. It went 11. The Dodgers used all nine relievers, Jimmy Nelson, Scott Alexander, Dennis Santana, Victor Gonzalez, Kinley Jansen, and Blake Trinan combined for six scoreless innings before the just activated Alex Vasilla allowed the automatic runner to score on a sack fly in the 10th. Then Will Smith got a two-run triple. So it's like, all right, we're going to win this game. And then Doc left to see it in. He issued two walks to load the bases. Then Mitch White came in, gave up a sack fly. And two outs later, the Dodgers lost again on a single. And that was the end of that. So another frustrating loss for the Dodgers frustrating for the fans and then Sunday comes around well you know I was just thinking about all of those that you were talking about with the exception of the one game in Cincinnati and in the game you're about to say they all sound the same Mm -hmm. it's the same storyline it's all the same thing maybe it's somebody different a different player didn't come through or something happened or somebody you know but it's all the same game like I said feeling uninspired yeah well you're in Dodgers mood (laughs) Because they certainly are setting the standard for uninspired. Yeah, it's definitely. Other than JT, for the most part. Yeah, I mean, really, where would the Dodgers be without JT? Because you look at the top of the lineup, you've got Mookie Betts, who would be the first person to tell you that he is not doing what he should be doing and not right. And he made, made some mistakes in that game three. He got caught stealing, which is very unusual for him. He went on his own. He was trying to get into scoring position, and it ended up, he got called out. So that was two outs, and then Corey Seager ended up striking out. So it, it didn't it didn't help anyway. You know, the little things like that that you see happening. Game four, the Dodgers had a big win, 16-4. to four. The bullpen was pretty much spent, but Julio Urias pitched. He went seven innings, four hits, one run, one earned run, no walks, 10 strikeouts, did give up a home run, but he went the distance, um, knew that he really needed to 
to stay away from the bullpen, didn't want to call those guys in early. Let's avoid our bullpen. Yeah. Well, and the interesting thing is Friday going into, or not Friday, I think, well, Thursday and Friday's game was, is going to be a bullpen game. Which when I heard that, I thought, with who? How, what are you, who's in the bullpen? How right. is that <laughs> going to work? I mean, it worked out well for, I mean, they lost, but they did show that, you know, they kept the Brewers scoreless over six innings, those six innings that they were out there. But I don't think the Dodgers have a luxury of doing bullpen games, not like they no. used to. But there was some sp- Nice surprises, some sparks in game four. There were two grand slams from A.J. Pollock in the first inning. It was his second career grand slam. He hit his first one on September 25th, 2015. So about six years later, he hits another. Matt Beatty has had one home run this season, and it was a grand slam. His first in the second. It marked the fourth time in franchise history that the Dodgers hit two grand slams in one game. When it was all said and done, A.J. Pollock had driven in eight runs. Beatty had seven, making it the first time that two Dodgers had seven-plus RBIs in the same game and just the sixth time overall since 1900. Mookie Betts, Corey Seager, and Justin Turner all got some rest in that 16-4 to game. But I will tell you, I was watching the game Saturday, and I know Max Muncy has a really high on-base percentage, probably, I think, one of the highest in the league. He walks a lot, but he is the personifies to me what the Dodgers are going through when he's at the plate. He used some very colorful language that could be hear, heard throughout the stadium. And he just, I mean, we've talked about him being kind of the grumpy old man. He didn't used to be that way. I'm not sure what's going on with him, but the Dodgers are out of sync. They aren't having fun. They don't look like they're having fun. And when I think about in comparison to the Padres, the Padres are having fun. When they play ball, they're having fun. Eric Hosmer, you know, maybe you need to celebrate, you know, hey, when you get somebody out at first, whatever it takes, right? But they always have smiles on their faces. They right. seem to. And so in comparison, you look at the Dodgers and it's like, oh, we got to go to the coal mine today. You know, they're just, ugh, it's just the same old thing. That's and the sound not- of the man working on a chain gang. That's it. They are so out of sync. It's not the same team. Dave Roberts looks like he forgot how to manage. I'm not sure he ever really knew how. I think last season, there was just a lot of things came together. Mookie came to prove something. Yeah. And they let him play. Well, yeah. I think when you are constantly... A good example is Matt Beatty. So he was... He didn't, he was on the roster for the World Series, didn't play. This year, he's on the roster. You'd see him pinch hit, and he was, you know, over every time. And he's not bad defensively, but then they sent him to the alternate site, and he wasn't there very long, but he was there long enough to get back into, you know, whatever, get back into sync, get right in the head, because he's come back and he's hitting. And he looks like he's comfortable, but he should be given that opportunity to play over DJ Peters or, and DJ Peters has been sent down, but Luke Rayleigh, those type of guys. When you have somebody like Matt Beatty, why aren't you playing them? Going back to AJ Pollock, he's an everyday player to me. Why aren't you playing him? Gavin Luck, maybe, you know, he had a wrist injury. He's come back. He's still a bust not doing anything. I think he got a hit for an RBI, but that was about it. So with Dustin May, probably the worst news for the Dodgers that he's going to, you know, have Tommy John surgery will be out. You know, as you said, probably we won't see him again until 2023. When you look at the IL, you haven't mentioned, you know, Caleb Ferguson, who was really coming on, uh, you know, into his own, 
during the World Series especially looked really good. He had Tommy John surgery. So you got some guys, you know, he'll be back hopefully next year. But when you look at the IL for the Dodgers, you don't have Cody Bellinger in the lineup. He's in Arizona. So hopefully he will be back maybe the middle of May. Zach McKinstry is in Arizona, but has not taken any swings. So I don't know what's going on there. You have David Price on the IL. Bruce Star Gratterall, he's going to have an MRI on his elbow. So that could be more bad news for the Dodgers. Tony Gonsolin, he, his shoulder is getting better, but still a ways out. Joe Kelly, which we found out had had so- shoulder surgery on the off season. They found some cyst in his shoulders was limiting his range of movement. And so he is coming around. But again, when is he going to be able to pitch? Brandon Morrow probably even forgot that he was a Dodger. Yeah. Again, he is having elbow problems. He's pretty much been shut down at least for the next couple of weeks or so, or for the rest of the season, we don't know. Corey Knable. I mean, it just, you know, when it rains, it pours and it's raining on the Dodgers. I guess the question I would have to ask you is late April or late September. So with all of these injuries and I guess even with the news about Dustin May, it's better that it's now and not, not September. Because the Dodgers still have the opportunity to turn this all around. Obviously, front office is going to have to look at pitching because who's going to slot in? How are they going to work the rotation? And is it going to be four-man rotation? What's going to happen there? So there's a lot of questions. But yeah, definitely it's better that it's happening now and not late in the season. So the Dodgers, there's always still hope. I mean, I every time I watch a Dodgers game, I still have the thought in that they're going to win this game and I'm going to cheer them on no matter what. Well, but just it when is you're ready to become a Detroit Tiger or a Pittsburgh Pirates fan, they have that 16 to 2 game. At least there was one really good piece of news out of the Dodger world. At the end of April, Trevor Bauer. Is donating $51,000 to Think Together. That was that month's, I guess every month he's going to do a different charity and for all of his strikeouts. So in April, he struck out 51. So that's $1,000 per strikeout, 51000 to Think Together. Yeah, very nice uh, that he's doing that. And, uh, and he even will say, well, you know, I got 10 strikeouts this one time, but I only got six this time. Still six thousand dollars toward a charity, but he kind of feels bad because it's only six. Right. So yeah, it's a good guy helping out. Oh, the he can always in Los give Angeles. more. Nobody told yeah. him he was limited to just <laughs> oh, I didn't strike him out. So the Dodgers coming up, as you mentioned, they have the they go to Chicago for three games to play the Cubs, and then they will be in Anaheim for three against the angels and your player of the week if you could dig through everything all the lack of inspiration and find one well i actually picked two this week i went with co players of the week and that's matt Beatty and aj pollock i looked over the games they played in because they didn't play every game in the cincinnati series or the milwaukee series but the games they did play Matt Beatty was 8 for 15 with 9 RBIs. Pollock was 5 for 18 with 9 RBIs. Pollock had 2 home runs. Beatty had 1, which was the Grand Slam. And, of course, A.J. Pollock had his Grand Slam. I just couldn't not give them props this week because they really were the bright spot for the Dodgers. I fully concur. And while... Initially, I had only selected A.J. Pollock as my uh, player of the week because he had the two home runs, the eight RBIs in that game. I'm going to amend and add 
Matt Beatty as a co-player of the week. And I had forgotten about that, that he actually, over the times that he did play, batted over 500 for the week. He did. And AJ and Matt were batting, I think, six and seven in that Sunday game. And they were the offensive power. So I thought they really do deserve the, the accolades for that. Hopefully they can continue. We'll see. If they get to play, Dave. The Angels and the Dodgers are really kind of feeling the same. Although the Angels don't feel so as uninspired, it seems like they're kind of playing the same game. The, the The Angels did win a series versus Texas this last week, but then they lost the last series versus Texas. And they lost the series versus Seattle and Houston. Pitching is a problem there as well. When I look through between the Texas and Seattle series, Shohei pitched okay. Quintana, once again, not good. Alex Cobb, who had been eh, serviceable, was not good. He left after a couple of innings in his last game after giving up six hits and three runs in that game in just a couple of innings. Andrew Haney, who had pitched two times in a row, pretty good. Pitching-wise, I need you, when you only do it once every five or six days, you need to be better all the time. Haney, not good. Griffin Canning was good. He was decent. And Dylan Bundy just ate up some innings. He was so-so, didn't get a win. Had, you know, moments in the game, but just so pitching wise, really, there was only one pitcher that had a standout performance in the last week, and that was Chris Rodriguez, the rookie. Hitting wise, we're still seeing some hitting. And unlike the Dodgers, who are surviving this losing streak or this rough patch because they started out so well, they were 11 games over 500 at one point. The Angels... Didn't have that cushion, but the Angels are hover are, are in it 13 and 13 as the week ended. So they're at 500. Had they had a better start, like the Dodgers, they'd be up there, or Kansas City, they'd be up there. But they did have a good enough start that they're not eight and 13 or seven and 13. So the 500s, it's better than you would expect based on how they're playing, but there's still a lot of things that are not happening as they should. Yeah, the Angels, you know, I did my pick for them to be win the West, and I really thought, yeah, I mean, they could really put it together. But again, it all comes down to pitching. You've got hitting seems to be fine you know the offense you're getting those hits he got Mike Trout but pitching is just not there and when we've talked about this and it's like beating you know just water on a rock if you don't have good pitching you're not gonna win a game you just it just is usually not gonna happen unless you're scoring 10 plus runs but even then you know we joke about you know, somebody like Kenley Jansen, where the Dodgers could be up 15 to nothing, but then Kenley comes in and they could lose, you know, 15 to 16 to 15. Yeah. Yeah. 16 to 15, whatever. And it just, I, it just is mind boggling to me that year after year after year, pitching continues to be a problem for the angels and why, is that not front and center? You don't need the, you know, offense. You've got good guys there. David Fletcher, Jared Walsh, Mike Trout, of course. Um, other guys pitching in, just Upton, Albert Poolhall. Albert's like off to one of the better starts of the last few years for him. Yeah. So that's not the issue, but pitching is. So where is the front office? Did they, did they forget that that's, you know, pitching is part of baseball? Well, the common denominator with the undervaluation of pitching, I think, is Artie Marino. 
because we've had different GMs, Jerry Depoto, Billy Epler, and now Perry Manassian, and we have the same thing happening. Perry comes in and says, yeah, I get it. We need pitching. Joe Madden saying, we need pitching. And in the end, we didn't get no pitching. We really need a group of buyers that are really rich, way richer than Artie, to make a deal he can't refuse and buy the team. Going to make him a deal he can't refuse. Because <laughs> that he... does seem to be the problem, is the owner. <laughs> Listen, you don't play baseball. You just own the team. Step away. What? Step off. Just go. <laughs> Step off. Call it. Step off, Artie. Step off. Step off. Well, step off, Artie. Injury problems are across the board, but they've had a pretty solid lineup every day. And Shohei has overall been great, hitting uh, hitting some bombs, pitching decently. One uh, one thing did come up: Tony Watson, who had pitched okay, is on the IL. He's got an issue, so that's a that's a tough one because. Our, our bullpen's not that. Mike Myers just went on the IL as well. Well, and what happened to Mike Myers? Because I was looking at the IL, and it says day-to-day, 10-day. And for him, it says out. <laughs> so that seems I, I don't ominous. think they know what – I know that they put him on the 10-day, but I'm not sure what, what that means. <laughs> Yeah, it was just he's, odd. He, he, he was out. Just out. Hey, he, he's gone for a couple of days, taking a little break. Take, yeah, he's out. Out of the I office. Needed, I need some beach days. <laughs> Doesn't yeah, everybody. so Tony Watson's got a calf strain, and then Mike Myers is out. There's no injury specified. No, he's, he's just, just out. out. You're now, out. <laughs> Step off, Myers. You're out of here. So they 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 did call up uh, James Hoyt, who was uh, they picked up in the off season from the Marlins. So we'll see if he actually was a good acquisition or not. But overall, they're an above average offensive team with a below average pitching staff, which makes them average, <laughs> which can keep them in. But the problem is the A's are started off. Strong after a slow start, they've picked it up and had that 13 game winning streak. The asterisks are starting to play as predicted, yeah. so now they're both moving up there. Seattle is still in a in a good spot, and we don't know can they withstand or or stay at the current level all season. Probably a first half team. We'll see what they can do in the second half. The Angels are hanging, but the problem is. They're, they're only one step away from being a bigger disappointment because they dropped down to below the Rangers if they dropped the last place. And the Rangers have shown they're not, with the exception of like Joey Gallo and Isaiah Kiner-Falafa, those two guys. I mean, they've got other players that are doing well, but they're still losing. And that's the thing with the Angels. It's a, it's a disappointing team, but unlike with the Dodgers where it's frustrating to see them do that is because every game, you know how good they can be because all those players have proven it with the angels. You know how good Mike Trout can be because he's always been pretty consistent and he's having the best start to a season in his career. And when you see the other guys like Justin Upton and Albert Pujols, who are putting together better starts than they've had in many years, maybe not the best in their careers, but in many years, you're still used to this with the angels. Fletcher is continuing to show what he can do. Jared Walsh showed that one month he was able to do add another month so far. So he's got two solid months of that. Rendon's been out injured and he's injured again. We don't know how long he'll be gone. I watch, but like the other day, by the time I got to the game, when I saw the score, they were so far ahead that I just checked in on them occasionally because I didn't want to, I didn't want to jinx it. 
<laughs> and it would be like they're they were already winning before I was watching, and then I start watching, they lose. Then whether it's my fault or not, I'm gonna blame myself for it. So because yeah, I'm that's that how important I felt. <laughs> that me just turning on my TV, they can feel my presence, and they get so nervous they they lose. Exactly, that's how I felt on uh, on Sunday because I missed the. Grand Slams, I had to watch those, go back and see those. And you had texted me and said, AJ with the, you know, granny. And it's like, oh, well, I better not turn it on because and, well, I, well. I saw that, but I was doing some things, you know, we're, we're having to, uh, to move soon. So we're doing a lot of things that are connected to that, which doesn't always fall into sitting for eight hours and watching two baseball games. I didn't watch that one either, and I kept getting notifications, and it would say, and then I saw one, Pollock and Beatty, you know, seven RBIs, or or Jared Walsh. Jared Walsh in that uh, in their game was four for four. Uh, that was a Saturday game for them. Sunday they lost. But what I'd like to see and what I think is important in a season is every season or every series, don't take it as, as a whole. Take every every series – and try to win the series. And if you can win two out of every three, or even split series to four, you're going to be in. You're going to be better than 500. But if you're going to continue to lose series, then that's not going to help you out. And all it takes is one bad stretch when you're 13 and 13 to put you down there in Pirates, Tigers, Rockies territory. Yeah, and then you can't ever seem to get out of that hole because you had a ladder, but then you got cold and needed to start a fire <laughs> and you used the ladder and now you're well, stuck. Don't use wood ladders. <laughs> right. Use metal. <laughs> metal ladders. Well, the metal ladder got struck by lightning <laughs> as your hole's filling up with water. <sighs> The problem, and like you said, it's hard to dig out of that hole because as the season goes, yes, there's a lot of injuries now, which had kind of been predicted by not knowing how last season's short season might apply. And maybe it has nothing to do with it. Maybe it's just a fluke of of how things, and maybe there's a different stress everybody's under that's causing some of these tweaks and things. Because, you know, when you're stressed out at home and you can just take a wrong step or twist the wrong way and your body's so tense, you end up having that injury. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe there's there's different pieces like that. I don't know. I mean, we can sit and rationalize everything and find a reason why. And, you know, will it get better? All these teams that are going through bad times will have a good stretch at some point in the season. The question is, who's going to be able to do that long term? And when you look at most championship teams of of any era, it's the teams who are healthy at the end Mm -hmm. that tend to win. You know, a lot of these teams, especially the ones that you didn't expect to make it, if they weren't healthy, and a lot of those teams don't have the depth. The Dodgers right now are showing that they don't really have the depth that they had last year or the years before and they're putting themselves in position, there's a fair chance that maybe they don't win the West because of injuries and things like that. And if they can't pull it all together. All right. So this coming week is World Series week at Angel Stadium. As last year's teams in the World Series both visit back-to-back to Anaheim. Tampa Bay, last year's runner-up, will start followed by the Dodgers, who will uh, will have the freeway series over the weekend. Like we said, we're in the diamond lane on our way to see it. But, of course, it's L.A., so there's a lot of traffic. It takes a long time to get there. Player of the week? I had to go with Jared Walsh and his 4-for-4 four four game, two home runs against Seattle in that 10-5 to five win. Uh, Jared Walsh is one of those players that – along with David Fletcher, just seems to get the hits when they need it or is consistent. And yeah, I have to go with Jared Walsh. I think last year 
especially towards the end when he came in to play. I think I had David Fletcher, Jared Walsh, David Fletcher, Jared Walsh <laughs> as my player of the week. So for my first entry of this of this season, Jared Walsh. I looked around and obviously Mike Trout's an easy choice because he just the way he's been playing and he's getting a lot of hits every game. But I went with Jared Walsh as well. Jared Walsh batted over 500, 522. He's 12 for 23. And during the week, he hit in every game. Every game that they played, he had a hit in this last week. Two home runs, seven RBIs. He was four for four versus Seattle. Had a three for five game versus Texas. He had a two for game and then, you know, some one, one first. But he's definitely proving that He's an asset so far. Will he continue? Maybe. I think a lot of people thought David Fletcher might be a fluke too, and, and or not an everyday player, but he's proving that wrong. I think Jared Walsh kind of fits in that same spot. What I'm hoping is, is that the Dodgers slump continues through the weekend. Next Monday, they can snap out of it. But over the weekend, I hope they're playing just as poorly and that the Angels decide to pick up their game so they don't get swept. All right, let's take a a look around the injured list of the league. I mean, around the league. Every time I think about this segment lately, as much as I'm tired of the commercial, it reminds me. Have you seen the commercial with the Nissan Rogue? And the kids are like, why do we do this every day? And, you know, you switch the little button. It takes you from different terrains and stuff. And so and then when you go to it's like, let's go to the beach. And then they've all got scuba right. gear or whatever. Well, now there's one where they, it's like, Dad, every day, all we do is is we do this every day. And he's like, well, you kids don't know what it's like to grow up back in the day. We only had, you know, a car that could we'd go out on a Sunday and maybe a gravel road and it was boring. Now there's the Nissan Rogue and you get the excitement of a driving experience. And I'm like, <laughs> shut up. Just, I'm, I, you know what? I purposely don't want a Nissan Rogue now. Not that I wanted one to begin with, but if there was ever a reason, sometimes commercials have the opposite effect, I guess. I don't want one simply because I mean, it's kind of be kind of interesting to go to a drive in theater and Brie Larson pull up in a Nissan next to you. (laughs) But I think about it because it's like you get in and you're driving and there's a sandstorm going and around the lakes kind of like that. We, We switch. We go to different places. Lately, of course, we've been driving in the slow lane behind uh what what the old uh, sunday driver thing the old lady that only drives her car on sunday on the freeway in the probably in the fast lane here doing uh, 25 or 30 because we we're always talking about the IL instead of uh, other stuff so let's do this let's start off with NL player of the month Ronald Acuña Jr got that of course he Eight home runs over the month, batting 341, 18 RBIs. And he was joined as the LA play the LA player of the month. Justin Turner. <laughs> no, the AL player of the month, who we haven't talked about at all because we haven't really talked about the twins, Byron Buxton, who has been phenomenal for uh, for the twins. You would think that the twins would be in a much better spot, but they had COVID. Yeah. But batting 426, eight home runs, 14 RBIs on the season. Somebody believes, and of course it's way too early for this, that he could be the guy to finally break 400 for a season. He could, yeah. We also have pitchers of the month. And two guys that um, may have heard of, Jacob deGrom and Garrett Cole. And they're both New York teams. So... They are well represented there. DeGrom had a, a 0.51 ERA, 59 strikeouts, four walks, 16 hits, over 35 inning. Opponents had a 136 batting average. And Garrett Cole, 4-1, 143 ERA, 62 strikeouts, three walks, and a 178 batting average for uh, against opponents. So... Both well-deserved there 
in the Big Apple. Relievers of the month. Not Kenley Jansen. Nope. AL was Matt Barnes. Nice. And then Mark Melanson. Who I, Which is no surprise. He's a, one of the weirdest, strange-looking guys. <laughs> he just is weird, but he I, is a good reliever. <laughs> I always wonder, because I never think about, or I've never listened when they call him in. Usually, come back out of commercial break, he's already throwing. So, you know, when they call him in. But I was wondering if his music, his, his walk-up music, is like Psycho Killer <laughs> from Talking Heads. Because he be. really looks like he's creepy. Yeah, I, I keep <laughs> waiting to see some sort of a Dateline episode about him. Keith Morrison, you know, doing the um, reliever is the name of the episode. And it'll be about Mark <laughs> Melanson and his killing spree. Well, I guess, you know, he killed quite a few Dodgers that came up to bat against him. He he has just this season. <laughs> and he did it last it last year as a brave. <laughs> So, yeah, he oh, yeah. continues He's, his serial killer ways. There is just something about him. And then, of course, your meme Mercedes was uh, rookie of the month for the AL. And then Trevor Rogers, pitcher for the Miami Marlins, got the rookie of the month for the NL. And then since we're on players of months and weeks, uh, Chris Bryant from the Cubs. Batted 417, 10 hits, four home runs, and he gets the NL player of the week. So the Dodgers will see Chris Bryant. And oddly enough, started to see some, you know, early trade talk things is that the Dodgers should be looking at Chris Bryant. And I keep thinking, mostly because he said they need they need him in the outfield. I'm like, well, I don't know that they need outfielders. But if I had to choose between a couple of players, would I take Chris Bryant? versus some of the other guys that have been uh, popping up that we've talked about. Yeah, maybe. You could replace Edwin Rios with Chris Bryant. But the problem is, is that he's, Chris Bryant's an everyday kind of guy. Right. And I can't see him, I mean, other than if they're looking at, with Cody Bellinger being out, who plays center field, and Mookie Betts is in right. So you're not going to, you know, you're not going to put Chris Bryan in right for me. You could put AJ, AJ in center. In center, because he is a, you know, as a center fielder. And or Chris in left. Yeah, you could do that. But I don't know. But I, 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 I don't know. Sometimes that seems the, kind of the silly trade ideas don't make a whole lot of sense. And if Justin Turner wasn't playing the way he is, then I'd say, well, yeah, maybe we want to look at that. And Justin can kind of be kind of transition to a utility guy or, or, you know, yeah. a replacement, but not. And then um, the AL player of the week who picked up his 100th win, Corey Kluber. Yeah. Two and oh record. 0.61 ERA, 15 strikeouts in his last game that he pitched against the Tigers. Eight scoreless innings, 10 strikeouts. And he's looking good for the Yankees. Now, speaking of New York, he got some problems in Queens with, I think, was it the Yankees fans were throwing baseballs onto the field in Queens, they don't even bother with that. They just boo. They boo their own team. They come up to bat. They get booed. They come out to play defense. They get booed. <laughs> they just they pop their head out of the dugout. <laughs> they get booed. And it's not good. Now, Francisco Lindor has come out and said, basically, you know, okay, I it's a weird feeling for me to get booed but i get it i'm not not producing i'm not doing what i'm what i should be doing what they're expecting so the mets have fired their hitting coach and their assistant hitting coach so chili davis and tom yep former angel and tom slater the assistant hitting coach are both out of a job we'll see who they bring in because yeah the mets you've got You've got the pitcher of the month on your team, and I think he's the only one that doesn't get booed. <laughs> Everyone else is. And I haven't seen any columns or any um, 
journalists or baseball writers coming to the Mets defense. So it must be well deserved. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing about the Mets. I get it. During the off season, there was so much hype about them. Their new owner says, I'm, I'm all in and they have a great pitching staff with DeGrom and Stroman. Taiwan Walker signed there. He's been pitching pretty well. I mean, they have a great pitch. Staff. And honestly, they've got Pete Alonzo, who's a rookie of the year. They've got a lot of players on that team. They should be doing a lot better than they are. These guys will get it together and they'll go on a run. And chances are they'll sign somebody because they'll look like a contender and somebody who's not going to be a contender will start trade at the trade deadline. will trade them somebody potentially, and they'll have a, they'll have a good run. Will they make the playoffs? I don't know. That's their division right now is weak. And miraculously in a Phillies Cardinals game, Bryce Harper gets hit in the face but does not have a concussion and no broken bones. It did hit the ball did end up hitting his wrist. So, you know, that's kind of a day to day thing. Isn't that the funny part that he's actually got the injury issues because of his wrist. Right. Not because of getting hit in the head with the it right in the face with a baseball. Right. So the Phillies are playing the Cardinals and the Cardinals had a pitcher Genesis Cabrera was pitching and he hit uh, Bryce Harper. I don't think there was any malice to that. It was fastball. But then Didi Gregorius comes up. He hits him in the rib area, you know, right in the ribs. And at this point, Joe Girardi comes out. He gets hit. No, he gets ejected. <laughs> Uh, he gets ejected that one, because that one was that one was on purpose. <laughs> right. Genesis said, "I am not putting up with this," and threw at him too. That's right. No, he gets ejected because his argument was, "This guy has hit two batters, one in the face, and why why isn't he out of the game?" Well. Thanks to Manfred, you have a three batter minimum, so he has to face another batter. The Cardinals manager, Mike Schiltz, you think, sir, he's like, hey, I would have taken him out, but he had to face another batter. I got to play by the rules here. And he did face another batter and he was taken out. Both dugouts were warned and uh, the Phillies ended up throwing one at Arenado. That took care of that. It's old school baseball. Mike Schilt even came out and said, yeah. And Arenado didn't like act like he was going to charge the mound or hold his bat a little longer. He just stripped off all of his pads and took first, headed to first base business as yeah. usual. And that was the end of that. It was taken care of in that. But that's scary when you know, you get hit in the face. I mean, we've seen guys, you know, think about Charlie Culberson and, you know, that super scary. Good for Bryce Harper that he, that he didn't, didn't have any broken bones and no concussion. Although some people said that they thought he had a concussion because he was on his Instagram page and he introduced himself. And they're like, why are you introducing yourself? <laughs> we all know you're Bryce Harper. <laughs> So they thought maybe he had a concussion, but I don't know. Maybe that uh, kind of jogged something. He's like, hey, it's the I'm new Bryce, Bryce Harper. Harper. <laughs> That's right. He yep. put on a big wig. <laughs> it's the new jam. He decided wig. that he didn't want to play in the outfield. He really wants to be the mascot, and he is now the new Billy Fanatic. <laughs> He's decided his career is going in a new direction. Lots of fun stuff this week, but let's uh, let's continue down the IL list since we kind of went there. Yelich, as in Christian and Lorenzo Cain, both back 
now. Luckily, the Dodgers didn't have to deal with them too, or they might have get got beaten worse. I'm sure the Brewers are happy. They've already been playing well. If these guys come in and do like they've done in the past, the Brewers may run away with the Central. And we didn't pick them. No. We were blinded by the Arenado light. Yes, I think so. The corner infielders got us, Goldschmidt and Arenado. The Brewers have been consistent the last few years, and they have a lot of good pieces. They have a lot of good pieces. They have uh, Josh Hader, who pitched back-to-back in games against the Dodgers, and he's back to his old form, like lights out. And so that's an important piece for them. Brandon Woodruff, who pitched in that series, looked good. Yeah, so they're clicking on all cylinders. For the White Sox, they will be without Luis Robert. He has a hip flexor that is causing him problems, and he's going to be out three to four months. Complete so tear yeah, of the hip flexor tear. muscle. Yeah, sounds painful, doesn't sound good. Three to four months for him. Could cause issues for the White Sox because not only now do you have Luis Robert out, but they lost Eloy Jimenez early on. I heard an interesting thought on this earlier today is that Jocelyn is back off of the IL just in time to meet up with the Dodgers this week. Could end up being trade bait to the White Sox because they're going to need an outfielder. Mm. Now, I don't know if that's the case, and I don't know what you know if the Cubs would do something like that. They might. That that's a rumor floating. It's a you know one of those way too early trade rumors. I don't think we should probably see. You'll probably start seeing them consider a trade earlier on if they're just not able to fill in the gaps out there. And with your mean Mercedes, as long as he can maintain what he's doing, you could probably play him out in the outfield somewhere, change things around. And I, I don't know. Now so there's did, that. Oh, I can say we had an interesting addition to the IL, the pitcher for the A's, Jesus Lozardo. Do not, Play video games before your start or the day of your start and get mad and hit your pitching hand onto the table because you can break your finger. And that's what he just bumped it. Well, okay. (laughs) (laughs) He bumped it really hard. And of course, I don't know. Is that really what happened? Did he, was he playing Mario Kart and he lost the race one too many times and he, at the table, mad. yeah, or he's he playing old school because, Pac-Man no. because Elvis Andrews is able to to beat him in that uh, that game, and he's mad about it. Well, it made me think that it wasn't what they said because of the way it was written. He has a left hand fracture when he bumped his hand against the desk. He just bumped his hand on the desk, and it's fractured. Yeah. Like some of these guys, how can they be professional athletes when they're so fragile? Yeah, that one was a weird one. Uh, the Cubs and the Braves had uh, had a little fun in their series. Uh, but before we get to that part, Travis Darno, their catchers on the 60-day IL with a left thumb sprain. It looks like the Cubs have an, are starting with the two-way player trend. The Angels had two with Shohei and Jared Walsh came up as a two-way player. And now apparently Anthony Rizzo is going to be joining the pitching staff when he's not playing first base, I guess. He has a zero ERA and in the game, it was a blowout game for the Braves when they played the Cubs and who is coming up to bat? Freddie Freeman. Frederick. Yes. Frederick Freeman. Perfect opportunity for Anthony Rizzo to continue his zero ERA. And he volunteered because another infielder, Mike Duffy, was going to pitch. But um, David Ross said, yeah, all right, Rizzo, you get in there. And best baseball moment, I think, of the week 
was Rizzo and Freeman. I'm surprised they didn't fall down laughing, but they had smiles. Everybody in the stands was laughing. And he keeps his zero ERA because he struck out Frederick Freeman. And he kept the ball. Well, I would. People should be laughing and smiling when they're playing baseball. You get paid to to put on a uniform and go play in the dirt. And you should have some fun. And this is the second time that we've seen Rizzo and Freeman have some fun. Freeman was caught in a pickle. And that's where Rizzo is yelling at him. Frederick! Freddie! And now the strikeout. They've got that little lighthearted rivalry thing going on. They do. And I will say out of, you know, you have favorite players across the league. And uh, Anthony Rizzo has always been one of my favorites from the beginning. Well, he was funny last year. Somebody would get to first base and he'd offer him some hand sanitizer. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> I mean, they were out of his pocket. He's. he's He's got that. That's one thing I always like about Albert Pujols. When you get to first base, he's like, he's like the Walmart greeter. Yeah. You're coming into the store. Rizzo's kind of the same way. They get there. They chat you up a little bit. You know, I like to see competitors. They don't have to talk to one another. But if they can be friendly, they're not giving away trade secrets. It's not like, you know, what was uh, the movie? Mr. Baseball, where Tom Selleck goes to Japan to play baseball and the American players would tell him, Hey, pick up and it's a pickup play, you know, <laughs> things like that. And they'd help each other out like that. So it's not like that. They're not doing those kind of things, but it, it's fun. And Rizzo is definitely good with that. And it's because of the way Freddie Freeman who up until last year, a lot of players, a lot of people didn't really know overall. You may have heard his name, but you didn't know him. He's become more of you see him laughing and joking and, and, and having a good time. You're drawn to that. Speaking of being drawn to players, I'm always been drawn to this guy because I remember seeing him as a kid on the field with his dad. And then when he came up, he just caused a stir. And that would be Vladimir Guerrero Jr. And this last week, Vladdy Jr. did something that Vladdy Sr. never did. He hit three home runs in one game got a lot of great players on that team. Marcus Simeon is there now. And this last week, making his season debut, George Springer. And he had a great game. And the next game, he was out and left early because he was winded. But (laughs) I think it does go to show the importance of spring training. What I noticed is pitchers used to by the end of spring training we're throwing deep into games sometimes even throwing complete games and now they really don't get much past five because they don't expect them to go farther and we see we've seen that a few times and we talked about it with uh with the dodgers especially why didn't you leave walker in for that at next inning he was still pitching well so i think we'll see in the coming weeks some of these players who have been out are going to start coming back. You know, Joe Kelly may very well come back. We don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing yet. A game that we do need to talk about is the Nationals and the Marlins. It was a two-hour and 37-minute game, and that was all because of Max Scherzer had more pressing issues at hand yes he did so he didn't mess around he got in got it done and then he headed to the hospital and his son Derek was delivered I think it was 5 38 p.m he weighed eight pounds five ounces mom and baby are doing great Max went in talked to the catcher said listen my wife's gonna have a baby and I don't have time to mess around pitched complete game and then left Two hours and 30 minutes used to be the standard game time, not three hours or plus. Come in. I I remember seeing games, two hours, 10 minutes, a full nine inning game, and not just a quick one to nothing affair. 
high scoring affairs, but the pitchers are pitching quicker. And he had a reason to go. He wanted to get his, his start in because he could have been off that day, but he got his start in and then he went to the hospital. Why is it that other pitchers feel like they need to fool around? Just get in, pitch, get it going. They say every game that I watch where they have a, a quick worker, they always bring it up. It's better for your defense because they stay more engaged in the game. Look at a game that takes forever. Go to a little league game. And when it's taking forever, look at the kid in right field. He's probably sitting down. Yes. Or he's thinking about it or he's wandering around or he's looking. If it's scenic around, he's looking at the dog across the street running around and playing and thinking he'd rather be running around and playing with the dog than standing in right field. That's the thing that people don't get. You got to keep people involved. That's why other games like soccer, basketball, even football, there's a lot of downtime, but once the ball's moving, there's a lot of action. In baseball, the ball can be moving. There may not be a lot of action, and that's because they work so slow. They fool around. It used to be stepping out of the box because the pitcher's taking too long it was just a short little thing, and that was all gamesmanship. Now you step out it's because the guy's still standing behind the mound doing whatever. Scraping off his shoes. He, uh, his last prayer about making a good pitch didn't do anything. So he's got to do a longer prayer behind the mound this time. Whatever it is, they need to speed it up from those things. The pitching coaches and the teams need to teach their to be more efficient and quicker, quicker workers. You don't have to be out there just grab and throw, grab and throw, grab and throw, grab and throw. You can slow up here a little bit in that, but I think it also throws the batters off guard because they're going to be constantly waiting for their pitch. And if you're working fast, when you throw that change up instead of a bunch of fastballs or, or all that. All right. Before we wrap up today, a couple little pieces of, of business, I guess. Uh, news from off the field. Uh, number one, let's go to Denver, Colorado. The Rockies GM. Jeff Bridich has resigned and you know, there was a major shakeup with the Rockies. They traded Nolan Arenado to the Cardinals. The Rockies have usually been in last place with moments here and there, but he stepped down from his role and Bill Schmidt, is the new interim GM. He was the vice president of scouting. I guess there will be a nationwide search for the Rockies, but this has definitely been a soap opera type, type season. And the fans were very happy with his, his resign with him resigning because they have suffered through enough with him. <laughs> And not having good player relationships. And so we'll see how this works out for the Rockies. And then finally, I guess not necessarily this guy, but we should expect to see these kind of things more and more. Uh, Roberto Alomar, Hall of Famer, has been uh, placed on the ineligible list, MLB's ineligible list, due to a sexual assault allegation against him. This supposedly happened back in 2014. The victim of that has not out suing or anything like that. It hasn't even been identified. So apparently she just says, I just want him to, there be consequences to his actions. With that, of course, the ineligible list, so he's not eligible to have any of the jobs, and he had basically to resign from anything and everything. He has resigned as a special assistant with the Blue Jays. He had a, uh, a spot on the board at the Hall of Fame. He's no longer on that. And, of course, you know, no other. I think he was doing something with MLB, too. So yeah, he's, he was a he's consultant. So now here's the thing. The Blue Jays cut their ties with him. They are also, because they've retired his number, took down everything or are in the process of taking down anything about Roberto Alomar Jr. The number. So does that mean that his number is unretired or does it mean stay retired? 
That's a good question. I guess if one of the Blue Jays say, hey, can I take this number? That will be the answer. I didn't get that. Uh, he's still in the Hall of Fame. Um, he was in enshrined in the Hall of Fame in 2011. He's also in the Canadian right. equivalent. He will still be there. He, this all happened, his playing days, you know, this was all before, or I, this happened, this allegation in 2014. So I don't get the, you know, you're just completely white, you know, whitewashing everything of uh, Roberto Alomar and out of, out of Roger Sinner. It doesn't make much sense to me because people are going to, he's still in the Hall of Fame. He's still, all of those records he has, his career, that doesn't get erased. So why take his number down or his name or his banner, whatever it is, why do that? It just seems a really overboard. Well, I know why they do it because it's like, well, what if, this victim or somebody else that may have felt victimized comes and they see his name all over the place. It's like, well, did he do this while he was in his playing days? This is the silliness of, of our times mm -hmm. in that the reason that he will remain in the hall of fame is that when he was enshrined, he was eligible. Uh, that's true. That's why Pete Rose isn't in there. Because he was ineligible before he could be enshrined into yeah. the Hall of Fame. Schematics. And so so I, I get it. But once again, what did you do on the field? You know, and 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 if this was the only time, if it happened three years after he was enshrined in the Hall of Fame, and I don't remember if he was a first time first balloter. But if he was, then that means that's eight years after he stopped playing. Where in this does that say it's revisionist history? He should absolutely be punished for any actions that are unlawful. We know that this is a thing that's been going on for a long time. We've talked about it in other situations, but we can't rewrite history and we shouldn't be trying to rewrite history. Something happened somewhere along the way that wasn't good. Doesn't mean that all this other stuff didn't ever exist. And Roberto Alomar, I never was a true fan of him. He was a good ball player, but I didn't really like him as a person from what I saw of him. But you can't erase his impact and his contribution to the game. Watch out. What's that? What's that coming out of left field? It's a Formula One race car. Oh, <laughs> so as the Dodgers have been on a slide and I do watch every game, but there are times where it's a little easier on my blood pressure, I guess, <laughs> to say to maybe just check out the game on, you know, game day and just just check in here and there. So I found a, I shouldn't say I found it, Planet had found it. But there's a series, and it's been out since, I think, 2018. It's on Netflix. It's Formula One, Drive to Survive. And it's all about Formula One and all the races and the teams. They have the Mercedes team and the Ferrari team and how the drivers will have contracts, but then maybe they're not driving well, but they'll end up at another team. So there's some drama and it's really interesting. And I don't, I've never been a racing fan and maybe it's cause I think of like NASCAR and they're just going around an oval, but formula one cars are actually, they're really cool. So it's kind of like you're playing, you're watching Mario Kart in a way. Uh, and they're the is tracks. Luigi in the pit. Is yeah. he like the, <laughs> the, the pit crew? No, well, maybe there could be a Luigi, maybe on the Ferrari team, but the cars are really cool. 
you learn about the different tires. They've got three sets of tires that they put on depending on the track and how fast they are. And the tracks are, you know, some of them, like the Monaco is right through the city. They, it's just really interesting. So I have been filling time as I've been checking in on Dodger games, watching a drive to survive formula one. And actually have found out that you can watch Formula One, usually DVR it because it'll come on at like five o'clock in the morning, uh, but you can watch it on ESPN and uh, get into all the drama with all of the uh, the race, the uh, drivers and what team they are. And so it's pretty cool. And that'll do it for this week's Sibling Rivalry Baseball Podcast. Remember, you can find us on our website, SiblingRivalryBB.com, and on Facebook and Instagram at SiblingRivalryBB. We're also on Twitter at SiblingRivalryBB without the A. Email us, show at SiblingRivalryBB.com. We'd love to hear what you think, so subscribe and rate us wherever you listen to our podcast. Next week on SRBB. Who will be doing donuts in the Angel Stadium parking lot? I think there's a Krispy Kreme nearby. <laughs>